Thank you. Oh, children just love this deer. I always get a little nervous because I make mistakes. No, they, they can't tell. Oh, no, really? Nobody can tell you make mistakes, dear. <laughs> Unless it's your cookies. Oh, <laughs> yeah, all right. All right. Oh, you my know goodness. The, you know it was oh. the stuffies that messed up those cookies, right. not me. Well, I'd like to have the mayor's Christmas cake. I look forward to that every year. Yeah, well, this year it is particularly good. Oh, whoops. Those gnomes are just attacking you, dear. Well, they, they like to be close. Right. And they want to listen to the story. Right. Today's story is about the enchanted Iditarod. The day dawned bitter cold. Now to be clear, here in Southern California, that means less than 50 degrees and cloudy. <laughs> the teams were bumping into each other as they hurried to ready for the start of the race. The tension in the air was palpable. Rumi, the North, half gnome, half dwarf, surveyed her twin brothers with mounting dismay. Lof was not wearing gloves and Oomph had on bedroom slippers instead of the boots that she had laid out specially for him that morning. They were both utterly hopeless, but she needed a team of three to compete and she was determined to win this Christmas race. All she needed them to do was sit in the sleigh and follow orders, but even that was looking doubtful. Go get your boots, Oomph and bring back the heavy gloves for Lof while you're there, instructed Rumi. She turned to Lof, and you go make sure all the unicorn harnesses are tied tightly. I'm gonna do the final check on the sleigh before starting. Now hurry. The next sleigh over was quite calm in comparison. Errol was cooing to her butterflies as she coaxed them into their teeny harnesses in readiness to pull the sleigh. This might be a good time for an aside. I should mention that the Enchanted Garden Christmas Iditarod differs from the Alaskan version of this race in a few minor ways. The first, it takes place in the air instead of on the snow. The second, the racers are in sleighs instead of sleds. Thirdly, the sleds are pulled variously by unicorns, butterflies, dragonflies, and kelpies instead of the Malamute dogs. Now, I should say that Kelpies you might not be familiar with. They're a magical creature from Scotland and they are shapeshifters. Usually you see them as horses, but they can also be people. And our Kelpies are gentle. Or oh, some of them are a little more, um, what would I say? Mischievous. Mischievous. Thank you, Santa. Thank you. Okay, the, ra the racers are Norths. Elves, fairies, and mermaids instead of humans. The race lasts 12 minutes instead of 12 days. I mean, come on, 12 days? Who are you kidding? Maybe yes for the Alaskans, but not for a fairy. That's just silly. In other ways, the races are identical. Well, okay, there's no $875,000 purse in the Enchanted Garden Christmas Iditarod, Tandy Buckabottom had baked a lovely cake for the winners that she was quite proud to display at the finish line, and all the garden residents had worked hard on their Christmas decorations to make the race festive. Now, back to the elves' sleigh, Errol and her twin Trill and Trafalan finished the last-minute tucks and tightenings and took their assigned positions in the sleigh. A quorum of new butterflies appeared to float around Errol's head. But that was to be expected. She was born that way and has been that way ever since. All was serene and quite perfect at the elf sleigh, which irritated Rootbeer to no end. Rootbeer, a fairy, was having trouble with her dragonfly pulling team. The lead dragonfly position was hotly contested and no one wanted to be in the swing spot because everyone who didn't consider themselves a wheel position candidate, reserved for the strongest, thought that they should be in the lead spot the smartest. It was chaos and the dragonflies were darting all over and shooting sparks at one another in attempts to intimidate. Rootbeer was about to pull her hair out and watching the unflappable elves just made it more annoying. Her teammate Marisol and Laylee were smart enough to steer clear of the whole situation. They'd slipped into Whitley's diner for a cuppa and would simply 
wait to see how developments unfolded. As was usual, the last team was mysteriously absent. Residents of the garden rarely caught a glimpse of the Mer people, but Tandy Bucklebottom had verified their entry and ensured that they were taking part in the race. As marshal of the event, the mayor took her responsibilities seriously. Rumi had gotten her brothers in line and brought their sleigh up to the starting point. All the gnomes and dwarves were prepared to cheer wildly for their hyphenate entry. The elves looked over and nodded a dignified and polite acknowledgement of the North entry. Rootbeer had managed to wrestle her dragonflies into some semblance of a team, and she pulled into the next spot at the starting gate with a determined grimace on her face. Marisol and Laylee scooted out to hop in the sleigh and complete the fairy contingent. In unison, their eyes turned to the empty fourth slot. Seemingly out of nowhere, an icy mist floated in. Creatures emerged and headed for the contestants. There was a moment of alarm, but then the sleigh appeared behind the creatures with the merpeople in it. Here was the last team, and what a team it was. The sleigh was made of frozen water, and the merpeople were gorgeous. There were two women and one man, all in long flowing hair, woven with flowers. The creatures pulled the sleigh Pulling the sleigh seemed to be very strong horses, but unlike anything you'd seen before. They were Kelpies, and they were formidable, as we said earlier. Ours are kinder. The sleigh pulled into the starting gate and silently stopped. The occupants nodded solemnly to Tandy and the other contestants without uttering a word. A chill emanated from their sleigh that cast a pall over the assembled teams. Rumi shook herself and grasped the reins more tightly. Remember, all you have to do is hold on and sit right where I told you, okay? Your job is to balance the sleigh, and that's all. Got it? She asked her brothers. I wish I could have gotten other teammates, she thought to herself. Oh well, all they have to do is sit. Even they can't mess that up. Gong! The starter's bell had rung, and Rumi jolted the sled off the starting blocks. As she lifted off, she pulled up sharply on the reins and gained height quickly to make up for her slow start. As it turned out, the rate of climb proved to be too much for Oomph, who tipped off the back of the sled and tumbled out into the cold blue sky. Loft reached out to grab him and lost his balance. There were two or three seconds there where it looked like he would manage to stay in the sleigh, but it was hopeless. He pitched face first out into the back and began to fall. Great, they can't even be ballast successfully, thought Rumi, as she circled the sleigh back in an attempt to save her idiot brothers. She dove, but they were too far below her and looked destined to crash hideously, when from behind her swooped in an enormous creature. It had the head of an eagle and the body of a lion. She feared it was going to eat them, but it flew beneath Oomph and feathered its wings so that he plopped gently down on its huge shoulders. Loft landed with a little thump a couple of seconds later, and then the creature turned in a banked move and looked Rumi straight in the eye. The moment stretched as the creature tilted his head to one side, as if asking Rumi a question. She sighed loudly and nodded. The creature took one big pump of its wings and glided abreast of Rumi's sleigh. It tipped its body slightly, and Oomph and Loft rolled back into the sleigh. Thud, thud. Now hold on, or I promise to make it, you regret it for the rest of your lives, yelled Rumi as she saw, saluted the creature and headed the unicorns back in the direction of the other sleighs. We have ground to make up, and I intend to do just that. The other sleighs were moving well, having just cleared Whopper Jr., resplendently decked out in his Christmas finery, and on to the unicorn paddock, which currently housed Santa's reindeer. Rumi took some risks by trying to fly through Whopper, Whopper's branches rather than the safer path around them, but it bought her some time and she was closer by the time the others were rounding the Sweet Dreams Hotel. The Mer people took some home field advantage going across Lake Rock Bottom and had pulled into a one minute lead by the time Rumi cleared the beautifully decorated elven castles. The elves were just behind the mermaids and closing when disaster struck. As they neared the vineyard, the butterflies slowed and became distracted. 
the new water wheel that the fairy Felly, a water sprite, had gifted was providing so much more water to the vines that they were thriving and the butterflies were enchanted by the scent. Oh no, the vines were flowering, drat the luck. The butterflies dove into the delicious smells and took the sleigh with them. The angle of dive was too steep and it tipped the elves' sleigh onto one side, dumping the elves into the rich vineyard soil. I fear that we face doom, for flowers here do bloom, sang Trill. You might recall, if you've seen other stories, that the garden is in complete agreement that I don't sing Trill's lines. Trill only sings, she doesn't speak. Nothing the elves said or did could convince the butterflies that chasing after the mer people in hopes of a mound of flour and icing, Tandy's victory cake, was preferable to row after row of delectable blooming flowers. The elves' sleigh met an ignoble end indeed, and the vinters were none too pleased about it either. Now the race was just between three sleighs, the mer people in the lead, followed by Rootbeer and her fairies, with Rumi closing in last place with her doltish brothers. The contestants rounded the troll bridge and were passing the enchanted mall jammed with Christmas shoppers. Rootbeer brushed water from her eyes. That was the second or third time she'd done that. Where was it coming from, she wondered. There was no rain. The sky was bright and the sun was warming up the day considerably. There it was again, this time even more. She was getting soaked. She moved her sleigh to the side a bit and looked back at where she'd been. There was a steady stream of water in the air. She traced it right up to the mer people's sleigh. It must be melting in the warming daylight, she chuckled out loud. What are you laughing at? asked Marisol. Keep your eye on the sleigh out front and you'll see, replied Rootbeer. There was a muffled crack and two shrill screams as all three occupants of the lead sleigh plummeted from the underside. The griffin had been shadowing Rumi's sleigh as she had correctly gauged the mental acuity of Rumi's brothers. Thus, she was too far back to effect a rescue of the mer people. Fate intervened nicely, though, as they had been passing over Splish Bosch at our pool, and the two mermaids plunked down through the thin ice into very cold water, although they also startled the skating lesson that was in progress. The merman landed with a thump on the diving board and bounced up into the air again, only to belly flop through the ice into the pond. The little ones getting the lesson applauded, thinking that this was some type of entertainment. The mer people were not amused as they climbed out, trying to regain their dignity. The race was down to the fairies and the north sleighs now, with Rootbeer in the lead. The fairy sleigh swung around Rootbeer's castle and headed past various buildings of the fairy university. The crowd was lining the course and cheering. Rumi urged the unicorns to greater speeds and her sleigh was, going, was gaining on the dragonflies who just didn't have the same stamina as the unicorns. Oomph and Lof peered over the sleigh to see what was happening. The north sleigh was pulling up alongside the, alongside the fairy sleigh. Rumi shouted at her brothers to get down to reduce drag. The course narrowed at the farmer's market and the two rocketing sleighs were bumping into one another as they flew at harrowing speeds. The final turn was just ahead and it didn't look like either sleigh was going to be able to make it. The crowd was scattering below as onlookers feared a horrible crash. Shoppers and shop owners dove into Gerald, the topiary giraffe, in fear of their lives. Rootbeer tried to take the inside of the turn, but she had indeed misjudged who was the strongest dragonfly and placed the wrong Odonata in the swing position so the sleigh failed to hold the curve. This allowed Rumi to cut inside with her more powerful unicorn team and gain precious seconds, but her sleigh swung wide and it hit Rootbeer's sleigh midsection. There was a horrified gasp from the crowd. The already exhausted dragonflies struggled to hold the sleigh upright, but the momentum was just too much and the sleigh tipped over and began to tumble. As it tipped, its runner snagged the runner edge of Rumi's sleigh and dragged it down, causing Rumi's sleigh to begin to tip. 
By now, the crowd was in mass retreat as rolling, sliding sleighs were falling out of the sky toward the finish line. Norfs and fairies were airborne amid the debris. Root beer, Marisol, and Laylee simply flew out of harm's way. But poor Rumi and her brothers had no such ability and were flailing helplessly. The sleds crashed down in a heap on top of the finish line and Tandy's Scottish Christmas cake. That's the one soaked in brandy with homemade marzipan and royal icing. Hers is so good that we forgive the use of almonds to make the marzipan. Almonds are ridiculous water hogs, you know, 11 times what it takes to grow other, other nuts. Once again, the magnificent creature swept in from behind to provide broad wings for the Norths to land on. Rumi stroked the feathers in appreciation as her brothers bounced up and down for the second time today. The creature deposited the Norths on the ground near where Rootbeer was hovering talking to Mayor Tandy Bucklebottom. Tandy strode up to the creature and tapped it as high up as on its leg as she could reach. Excuse me, you up there. I'm speaking to you. Hello. Rootbeer, do fly up and get its attention, please. Suddenly, the creature bent down and its huge beak was inches from Tandy's nose. What can I do for you, female with hairy feet? <laughs> yeah, Tandy doesn't take to that kind of thing very well. I'll have you know that my feet are considered beautiful, but I'll overlook your ignorance because you have saved three of our little ones so magnificently, allowed Tandy. Whoa, old girl, soothed Fergus. What say we ask this hero to have a cuppa and we talk over what happened here today? We haven't even thanked him properly for saving our friends yet, and that just isn't the garden way, now is it? Tandy allowed that Fergus was right, and they invited the creature back to her hobbit hole for a cup of tea and some of her famous baked goods. She'd been baking gingerbread cookies for days. The crowd outside hung around because they knew that Tandy would be back to tell them what was happening. Sure enough, it wasn't long before the two hobbits and the creature emerged and some announcements were made. Thank you all for being patient, began Tandy. This is Gilfie, the griffin. She saved Rumi and her brothers today, and we owe her a debt that we can never repay. We've invited her to stay a while, and she's agreed. Please make her feel welcome. She's not nearly as fierce as she looks, and she's been a little lonely since, and so the garden is just the right place for her. Now, as for the race, Rumi was in first place before the accident, which would suggest that she wins, but the accident was Rumi's fault, so the committee has awarded first place to Root Beer's Ferry Team and second place to the North Team. No one gets a piece of cake be I baked because you all ruined it with your reckless driving, but Truff has generously offered to provide cupcakes to the winning team, which won't be nearly as good as my cake. Whether or not that has anything to do with the fact that his fiance happens to be on that team, I'll leave that for you to decide. There was talk of making this an annual event, and you, as you will recall, I was against that. Consider today. There were four entries in the race and four crashes. Do the math. Now, let's get busy and clean up the various crash sites. We'd like the sun to set on a beautiful enchanted garden before Christmas morning. The end. Stay magical. Ho, ho, ho! Did I do all right, Santa? Oh, well, fantastic, dear. Uh, I felt like I made so many mistakes. Fantastic. Merry Christmas. You're in a good mood. Merry, it's almost Christmas. You're right. You're right. All right.